into it. Sure. Um, I'll give a very tiny introduction about myself. Yeah, because I want to know about you too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, I guess first to the audience who's watching, thank you so much for joining the Leaders in Trade Compliance Podcast. I'm your host, Nadine, as you can see, pretty big up here. Um, the purpose of this podcast is kind of, you know, to help people understand a bit about the trade compliance topics as well as the people who are in it. So when it comes to me, I, I'm the founder of Work Trade Compliance. It's, it's a consultation firm, right? I do consultation at the same time. My, my main focus is kind of teaching people who are within this industry or who, who want to grow within this industry. For, so for example, I help people study for the custom broker exam. I help people with appeals for the custom broker exam. And then on the other hand, if someone needs some kind of consultation, then they can come over to me and I can help them out with the other things as well. Nice. I, I began, um, I opened Victory Compliance back in 2020, but I began my career with this industry in 2016. Um, wow. To be honest, I, I kind of stumbled upon it. Um, after my MBA, I applied a bunch of jobs. Um, I, I got an internship at one of the trade compliance firms, and then I kind of fell into it after that from internship to getting a full-time job, then a couple of promotions, then jumping into the company, and it, it, it kind of led me to where I am. So I, I, I've kind of seen a bit of growth in the past. I mean, it, it's been five years, but I feel like my growth has been a bit more or a bit unusual than a general person's growth in terms of yeah. where I started and how far I've come within this short period of time because usually yeah. people who are within this industry I feel like it takes them about 10 11 years to go from when they begin in this industry and then get somewhere uh, I feel like I was able to do that in five to be honest uh, and it was all hard work I'm not gonna say I'm a genius or anything like that mm -hmm. I, I sure. to everyone who's watching I mean you have to work hard you have yeah. to have your goals within your mind. Yeah. You have to understand where you want to be in five years, and then you have to work to make that happen. Yeah. No, definitely. And yeah. also, also, I think the um, the timing too. I mean, so much has happened, and we're never we're inevitably going to talk about it. But the you know the past two and a half years have just been crazy, right? Yeah. So I mean that's like a trial. I by feel five. like it's been crazy since 2016, since the whole right, exactly. With, yeah, with 301. Right? Yeah, so like you've been baptized by fire, just thrown in there. So, yeah, <laughs> you've made the best of it, which is awesome. So yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so let me hand it over to you, James. Why don't you tell the audience a bit about yourself, and your background, and where you come from, and what you do? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll try to keep myself from. Um, meandering too much so just just cut me off okay um no just, right. you know, stop it but uh yeah I, i'm james roman i am a licensed customs broker i got my license last year uh in the october 2021 exam i think that makes it no, nice. um yes. or 2020 exam and i got it last year honestly uh life is so insane that i can't even keep track of <laughs> But uh, but yeah, so I, I grew up in North Carolina on the East Coast, spent 18 years there. Uh, I went to, to college in, in a small, small uh, college in Ohio, actually, um, Franciscan University. Met my wife there, um, got a degree in, in uh, humanities and, and philosophy, and um, actually worked at that university uh, for two years. So I also got my MBA at that time. Um, because staff members were able to get it for free. Um, I always thought I was going to be a professor either of history or philosophy. Um, but, you know, things things worked out a little a little differently. Um, my my wife, who, you know, is really important for this story um, and important to my life in general, but uh, her parents have owned a, a customs brokerage and um, a freight forwarding company separately. Um, the brokerage has been running since 2001. It's Juliana Lim Customs House Brokerage. Um, it's the namesake is my mother-in-law, Juliana. Um, she's a Korean American, uh, immigrated in the late '80s, I believe, and uh, began just kind of happenstance at a, at a freight forwarder. She loved customs, was really good at it, and decided to kind of break out on her own. And so the rest is history. 
uh, we've been serving LA since 2001 um, have gone up and down and with, with the market and everything, but we've stayed, stayed true. Um, and so uh, there was also a freight forwarder that was open, you know, in 2008, a separate company, just common ownership. Um, but uh, there were, um, you know, some, some issues with uh, some, you know, former employees and uh, you know, it kind of, it, it brought the, the, the companies kind of to their knees, you know, I don't want to talk too much about it, but basically, you know, some employees um, did some pretty nefarious things um, and it was found out. So we, you know, they always suggested to me and my wife, you know, come and come and join the company if you want to. And I was always like, no, I want to go on my own. I want to do my own thing. I've got my MBA now. You know, I'm going to go work in <laughs> corporate America, make money or whatever, you know. Um, and they were always super, super respectful of that. Um, and, you know, just gave us our space. And my wife is a clinical psychologist. She's fantastic, gifted, also has a master's. Anyway, um, so uh, 20, 2019 happened where all that broke. Um, and they, you know, suggested again, you know, a little bit more, you know, earnestly. But, you know, my wife and I were, you know, kind of thinking and praying about what to do next. And it just clicked like, yeah, let's do this. Let's go do it. So yeah, since 2019, I started in the industry and um, immediately wanted to start studying to get my license. Uh, unfortunately, I, I wasn't a student of you at the time. Maybe I could have benefited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you pass. That, that's how I pass, matters. right? A pass is a pass, it right? Don't ask me this question. It doesn't matter how you did it. You pass. That's what matters. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so um, yeah, I just, just worked there and, um, you know, COVID hit almost instantaneously um, and we were just scrambling around and just trying to figure out how to, how to make ends meet um, whilst I was studying. And um, yeah, just got really invested into the, the marketing aspect of things and just trying to do things a little bit differently, um, position ourselves as more of like a service oriented, um, you know, compliance heavy type small firm. And we are very small I and mean, we have about 11 employees um, and, and two licensed brokers. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's where I am now. Like I'm in, I'm in love with the industry, uh, and, and to dovetail off of the, the sales and marketing, we were getting a lot of, of good inbound, um, inbound leads and things like that. But a lot of these, uh, importers to be, or importers that are already established, they would always ask me the question, you know, before we'd hang up, like, hey, do you know anybody, like any other factories? Do you know any other buyers for my product? And of course, I'm like, no, I'm too busy. But it happened so often that I was like, man, like, this is a huge opportunity. If I was able to have like, you know, a like a Rolodex of, you know, different factories, different connections and different like continents and, and industries and sectors, this could be really, really helpful for people. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, I reached out, I met this, uh, this Dutch man, uh, Cornelis Wildenberg, and uh, mm -hmm. he and I started working together on what they call like corporate matchmaking. So um, connecting buyers and sellers. And then along the way, you know, if it's going to the US and, you know, I can advise on, on compliance and customs regulations and um, also, you know, OGA stuff as well. So, uh, yeah, recently Cornelis um, and his partner in Turkey and, and myself started a company, Cub Consultants, and um, we're, you know, fully, fully uh, rolling right now. Got a few fun projects working on in, in L.A. And, and elsewhere right now. So, yeah, kind of like in two uh, full time jobs, uh, loving it. I, uh, <laughs> I have a three year old daughter who's amazing and. Uh, I booked the babysitter for her today because <laughs> she would be she's not napping. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise. And then I have one on the way as well. So, um, so yeah, life's good. And I'm really thankful to be here. Hopefully we can help uh, people with our conversation. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. I, I still feel like even your story is a bit crazy because you kind of fell into it, right? You just happened to know someone at the same time the fact that you were able to pass the custom broker exam that that's a huge achievement you know 
a lot of people, sometimes people come to me and they're trying to pass the exam and they've taken the exam four or five times and yeah. they, just, they just can't do it. So they come over to me and they, they, they ask me, how can we do it? Um, and it's, it's just one of those things which it doesn't test how smart you are. It doesn't yeah. honestly do anything for you except give yeah. you a certification. Yeah. Uh, but it still means a lot in the industry. Right. And the second thing I noticed from your story was also that you had no background in trade compliance. Uh, yeah. I really wanted to ask you the question that have you so far, have you met anyone who actually meant to come into this trade compliance industry? Because I feel like everyone I've met, they've just kind of fallen into it one way or another. I don't think I've actually met anyone who studied for it, who wanted to be in it, and then they came into it. I don't know a single person. I don't know a single person. I figured one of the one of the best brokers I know, Sun Sun Kim, in he, he works for Alba Wheels Up in LA. He's like, he was going to be a cop. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> how does this stuff happen? You know, so uh, right. It, I I don't know a single person that was like, I went to college for supply chain and like, you know, got my degree like with the intent of like doing. Bro I've never met. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And and go, going to back going back to the I guess the consultation slash custom broker service. What kind of uh, for for the people who are watching? Yeah. What kind of industry do you serve? You know, you, you might have someone who wants to watch this podcast and they're like, oh, I, I need James for something. So <laughs> what kind of industry do you serve? Sure. Um, I'm gonna say what everybody hates to hear, which is like kind of everything. You know, just just not alcohol, um, alcohol or firearms, um, which you know, that's, I feel like that would be really cool, but we just don't have the. the <laughs> um, but no, really, looking at it, um, textiles, apparel, um, consumer products like toys, especially, mm -hmm. and um, um, food, food and uh, vehicles, yeah. yeah. That's really our main our main bread and butter. We have other stuff, of course, you know, in, in most that's other awesome. sectors. That's really the that's majority. Awesome. By the way, I, I'm a licensed custom broker as well, but I don't I don't I don't use it as a custom broker. I just have it. <laughs> just, really? I, think I, I got it back in twenty nineteen actually. Uh, I took back over twenty nineteen exam. Um just took it once, was able to pass it. I just have the exam but I don't really use it for brokerage purposes. I'm just keeping it. Really? Be, well, but you, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you're at Dyson, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a, a, that's kind of like my full time job. And then, um, but we, we uh, as I don't need the license for that job. I got you. Know? you. We, we, we use the, the broker's license. You, you can be a custom broker with it. But then you can do the other the other stuff. You can do that. You don't need to license for any of that stuff. Sure. So I, yeah. I guess even for everyone who's watching, a licensed custom broker, it's a good perk to have. You know, it's nice to show. But yeah. unless you have your own brokerage firm, or if you're the main license holder for a brokerage firm, you don't really need a license. It's not required for anything. Yeah. So it, it's like a, it's like a plus to have, but it's, yeah. it's not required. So a lot, right. a lot of people kind kind of try to get it because they wanna uh, they either wanna switch industries, yeah, you know whether whether they wanna go from a custom brokerage portion to an importer side or exporter side or you know switch around, or if they wanna progress in the career, if they wanna if they're looking for a promotion or something like that, this kind of helps them show whoever is going to give them that title that see i know the stuff but it doesn't yes. really unless you're running a brokerage firm or you're like a corporate license holder you don't really need that license for anything you just right. have it and that's that's pretty much it as long as you pay that that fee for it you're good yeah but i mean uh, to kind of go off what you just said um I'm sure that like when they were going through candidates for your position, the fact that you were licensed definitely bumped you up for consideration. Yeah, definitely for sure. Uh, that, that, that's like that's what I was kind of saying. You know, it's 
So it's funny to me. Um, if, if you have it, it's a plus. People look at you in a better way. Oh, yeah. But the people who have it or the people in the industry, you kind of know that it doesn't mean you're any smarter than someone else. You know, <laughs> yes, if, if I, if, <laughs> as a licensed custom builder, if I, I was hiring someone, whether they have a license or not, I mean, it show if they tried, they even failed, that shows their effort, that shows they want to yeah. be somewhere. So I yeah. appreciate that, you know. Yeah. Uh, and if they passed, I would appreciate that. I guess kind of like it shows their commitment. But yeah. to me, I won't think they're any higher or lower than the person that doesn't yeah. have it because I know people who have been in the industry like five years, 10 years, and yeah. they just can't pass that exam because with the exam, it's nothing. It's not about memorization. It's not about how much you know. It's just are you a good exam taker or not? If you right. are, if you, if you can figure out the technique for passing that exam, you don't need to memorize a single thing. And to be honest, yeah. when, I was studying for, when I was studying for the exam, I did not try to memorize a single sentence in that book. Yeah, I, right. I, I didn't. Uh, I, it works out different for everyone, right? But for yeah. me, I focused on the tactics and what I had to do to get to the right answer, rather than what I had to memorize, because yeah. I did not memorize a single thing for yeah. that exam. Yeah, I mean, I I don't trust myself to memorize just about anything. <laughs> you know, I have <laughs> lists on my phone and everything, so. I mean, it's exactly as you said, like in, in several posts that I've seen too, it's like, just know where to find yeah. stuff. Like that's yep. the most important thing. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And then I keep, you know, even when I tell people how to study for it, I make sure they understand um, that factor. If they don't, for example, have the proper, the proper methods of studying, it doesn't matter what they try to do. What matters is trying, is, getting to the right answer as fast as you can. If you can do that without knowing even where the information is, if you can somehow find a way to get to it, then you'll be good. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. And I think a skill that's really tough is like knowing kind of when to stop yourself, especially like when reading, like mm -hmm. there would be nights where I was like reading just to try to, you know, get a hold of the concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, where it's like, I don't even know what this is. Like drawback, like don't really know what that is. You know, like I, I want to learn about what drawback is. And I would start to read and it made a lot of sense and whatever. But, you know, like chapter 10 is like gi gigantic. It's about a bunch of different things. So oh, yeah, chapter 10 like, is crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, so like I started to read that and it's like, whoa, this has no like, you know, un unifying principle just about. You know, like I need to stop myself and let's go over the subheadings and see what's where in the market. And, you know, I'll just I'll just come back to it <laughs> if I need if I need to, you know, go figure out, you know, what like I think duty fee programs or whatever are in there or whatever. Um, and it's like or like fee, like schedules of fees, maybe it might be a, a bunch of random stuff. Yeah, right. So it's like, I'm yeah, like you know, stop yourself before you like, you know, cry your eyes out trying to, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, something like that, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, before we kind of, I, I want to talk a bit about, you know, talk, talking kind of like off drawback. I want to talk a bit about the, some of the regulation, but before I do that, I guess right. I kind of want to ask you, so if, if uh, from your point of view, if someone wanted to do well in this career, what would they need to focus on from your point of view? I mean, I mean, you, you're kind of part of the whole custom brokerage firm, right? So I guess um, if someone wants to enter this field or they want to work for a custom brokerage firm, what kind of skills would you want them to have? Because I mean, uh, like we mentioned, most of the people who fall into this are not studying for trade compliance. They kind of fall into it, right? So. Uh, yeah. Because the reason why I'm asking this is because sometimes people come to me, right? The new generation, they they want to understand. They, they they've heard about trade compliance, and more than ever, I mean, it's kind of one of the topics which is a hot topic, right? So they want to understand that they want to get into it, and they want to even work for a custom brokerage firm, but they don't know how to enter, I guess. So from your point of view, as someone who's working with a custom brokerage firm, if you were to hire someone who will eventually fall into it. What kind of skills would you be looking for? Sure. Um, 
So definitely, so I have like a, a couple hard and a couple soft skills that I would really, really like to see in somebody that I would want to hire one day. Um, the hard skill would be classification. If you can really work yourself through classification or at least just know, know your, um, your GRIs um, and you're able to feel comfortable and confident um, about classifying goods on your own, um, that would be great. Um, and then the, the second hard skill I would say is um, just knowing, knowing where to find things. Um, I was talking to, you know, our license holder, Juliana, about, um, you know, like there are so many inquiries we get every day of, about all these different things. And in a day, like I'm able to help like three or four people figure out, you know, o like OGA things, for example. Like mm -hmm. how to get in like a like a motorcycle versus like an electric bike versus you know like this food that has dairy in it, um, you know, and all this th stuff we're able to access right away, but it's because y you have to know where to look, you know, on the internet. Mm -hmm. So like, are are you good at finding answers on your own, um, and like strong answers? So like you get it from you know government website, but you quickly brief, you know, brief over, you know, 49 CFR or 21 CFR to, you know, kind of validate yourself. Um, so you don't make a big mistake, you know, um, yeah. those kind of hard skills, classification, and then finding things out on your own and being really certain about it. Um, and like strong in your, in your findings, that would be, you're kind of unstoppable at that point. I would, I would hope. And then a soft skill, I would say um, to try to be as like consistent as possible because I know like working in brokerage, like I catch myself, you know, from time to time, just, you know, you, you have so many things coming through, so many entries you need to clear. And like, you know, this client, like you kind of know their, um, like their stuff. Oh, here's a new shipper. And it kind of looks like this, like, eh, I'm going to just classify it as like what I, my first impression is and then send it off. Um, but that's kind of lazy brokerage. And those are the entries that come back to bite you too. Um, yeah. You know, if you get audited or if you get a, a CF 28 or something like that is just try to show up every day and just say, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to kill myself, but I'm going to reasonably put my attention into everything I'm doing. Um, and that's something I try to, you know, I struggle to live by too um because we're human beings but um just kind of staying sharp staying consistent if you're a consistent person um don't necessarily even need to be super organized although it helps but being really consistent and committed to detail um when you're in when you're in the office is is huge um and then the last soft skill i would want to see would be um you know somebody who tries to stay current as well mm -hmm. you know because regulations are changing all the time. I mean, you know, I mean, like just starting in 2016, I mean, a radical shift occurred, you know, once, you know, 301 hit, everything changed. And then with COVID and, you know, you know, exclusions to 301 and, you know, the Uyghur, yeah, withhold release orders. And, you know, it, it's just crazy. Like you have to, it, you have to sign up for for newsletters, like you have to stay mm -hmm. current. So if somebody's yeah, willing to do that, then I think that's it's huge. And I feel like one of the things in trade compliance that you really actually need also is you need to be able to take a step back and kind of understand, learn how to understand different topics. You know, like, like we kind of spoke about like part part ten in nineteen CFR and drawback and stuff like that. So. If you have someone who can kind of take a step back and look at the big picture and they know how to do that, I feel like that will take them to places, you know, it will really benefit them to be able to kind of understand the, how they can summarize stuff. Yeah. So because every time there's a new topic, new regulation, stuff like that, if you can just kind of take a step back and know that you need to do that, yeah. it will benefit you a lot. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's exactly yeah. right. It's exactly right. And, and talking about regulation, I guess like that that kind of leads us to the Mod Act, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> and staying <laughs> up to date with everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah right. to, to be honest, I, I kind of know overall what it's about, but I don't know the details. Um, yeah. So then, well, cool. why, why don't you talk a bit about what it is, I guess, for the people yeah. watching? Yeah, I mean, as always, the disclaimer is, uh, you know, go read it yourself. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you have to read it yourself. Don't take my word for it. But, um, you know, what, I, what I've what i taken away and what we've advised are specifically our freight forwarder clients. Um, the Mod Act is, you know, it's, it is what it sounds like. Uh, it's, you know, trying to take things like, like things have been kind of moving in that direction where we're kind of centralizing things. You know, we, we moved away from you know, offices to now, you know, uh, centers of excellence and expertise that kind of centralized um, points of contact for brokers to to talk to, you know, government experts and things like that on different mm -hmm. issues. Um, and now we're getting rid of, we, we had the national permit, um, which was, I guess it was a new thing way back when, um, before it was only district. Um, but now mm -hmm. there are some people who, you know, are still district only that are now being you know kind of forced to adopt the national or um yeah the national permit so uh that that's pretty huge i don't think it affects very many brokers um but i mean that's a big part of it is like how is that going to um how that's going to kind of change what what they're going to do they're just basically going to like phase out district permits altogether and, and just just do national permits for brokers so, um, you know, essentially everybody will be able to remote file now um, or will have to remote file. So that's kind of a moot point. I mean, those people know who they are. Um, they've been diligently serving their districts or whatever for, I'm sure, a long time. And so now they're going to, you know, be with the rest of us in national permit bill, you know. So that's that's kind of the majority of the text. But... The thing that affects brokers the the most besides that would be um, obtaining the power of attorney directly from the importer. So mm -hmm. that fa what a, a very popular um, you know occurrence with a broker and importer freight forwarder relationship was it used to be that you could get a sub power of attorney from the freight forwarder to the broker. And then the sub power of attorney from the importer to the freight forwarder. So that was easy because there wouldn't be, you know, the broker wouldn't be sending their POA down the line. It would just, you know, both parties would communicate with the freight forwarder independently. Broker would send their invoice and the documents to the forwarder, whatever. But that that presents problems because what customs has apparently seen um is you know importers will you know get a like a cf28 or you know cf29 and they'll say like call your broker and they're like i have no idea who my broker is or they or customs says you know this is your customs broker they did this and this and i i don't know who that is you know mm. blah blah freight forwarding company clears customs for me what are you talking about i don't know these people so um you know that has that has a lot of risks and then likewise, from broker to importer, um, there there have been issues apparently as well where, you know, the freight the freight forwarder will say the importer said this thing is made out of this. Clear it as it's made out of this. But no such conversation ever took place, right? Um, we don't have direct conversation with the importer. So bridging that gap, um, there are no more sub power of attorneys allowed. So the broker has to have direct contact with the importer, which has been like a standard practice for quite a while. Um, but they also need to, you know, obtain the power of attorney from like from the broker to the importer. Um, and that may make things difficult for freight forwarders um, because it does kind of add an extra step for them uh, to kind of go between. So I, that's I the like mod act, really, I, I think. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of, uh, at least the big companies, they already do that. Um, yeah. They, 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 because they want to control 
who's able to clear the goods they want to have visibility of what's being cleared under their name yeah so, so stuff like that so i feel like it's it's it was probably more of an issue for small importers yeah. to import and then they have these fit forwarders who kind of use their sub firms to kind of clear the goods and so so they, they think the fit forwarder is clearing the goods when in fact it's kind of the same company but not the same company there's like a sub company yeah. that clears the goods for them and importers don't those importers don't really understand that yeah. the fit forwarding company is one company and then the custom brokerage is another legal entity you right know? so it's completely like a different company it's yeah. the same thing yeah and i i think it's a really good step you know in the right direction that kind of forces importers to understand who they're working with yeah that, that gives them a direct connection to the brokers and to be honest that's like one of the main things if, if your company in my opinion if your company is having issues managing brokers that's one of the things you should already be doing you should be limiting your POAs, who it goes out to, and you need to revoke all the POAs which have been there for the past God knows how many years, you know? Yeah. So that, that's, uh, I feel like that's actually going to help just, just the custom phase. I think it's going to have a positive effect at the end. Yeah, 100%. I don't really know too, too many freight forwarders that even do sub power of attorneys anymore. Um, I know there are still some that are out there. Um, I've talked to a few, but they just have a different style of business where, you know, they generally, they don't care about compliance and their clients don't generally care about compliance, but everybody cares about money. So, I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, and, and, and quite honestly, you know, not to talk down on anybody because at the end of the day, everybody's trying to feed their families um, and hopefully not over enrich themselves. But um, yeah, I mean, Customs is kind of targeting that kind of behavior all around. Um, they want to prop up the firms that are trying to do the right thing and try to discourage the, you know, the not so good kind of dodge regulation dodging behavior that that does occur. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does occur, um, um, especially in LA too, um, but uh, but not by us. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Honestly, I I don't think I would ever have the guts to perfectly not be compliant. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what kind of people do that, but yeah, hey, you can say. And there's there's also another thing that custom is working with the brokers on, right? The verification of importer identity. That's kind of yeah. like a more, uh, I I guess, uh, it it makes the brokers a bit more accountable. Is that yeah. the whole reason behind the whole thing? Do you also want to talk about talk a bit about that? Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean that's really the that's the most interesting thing. I think the Mod Act um, is kind of meh, but it's really coming it's really coming into effect in December, um, I think December twelfth or something like that. So that one is like it's live, so everybody better brace for it. You need to make all those necessary changes right away. Um, but the, the validating power of attorney, um, the importer identity that is still in the proposed phase as it's scheduled on, um, the, what is it called? Oh, oh I forget what it's called. Federal register. Ah, there it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's due, it's due to be adopted in February, 2023, but we'll see. Hmm. Um, but the, I mean, that, that is something that should raise a lot of eyebrows, um, for not only for brokers, but also importers and freight forwarders too, uh, because th there's going to be a lot more documents requested. Thankfully, I've actually seen a lot of, I mean, we've, we've taken this approach since the proposed rulemaking came out, which I think was in 2019, but we've been taking that approach ever since it came out. Cause we're like, okay, look, we got to train people. Um, to think this way so that when it does become adopted, it's just, we've already been doing it, but it, it requires a lot of, of documentation that a lot of people may not be used to. Um, and again, it, it kind of goes after people that may not have great intentions that want to dodge, um, you know, want to kind of bend the rules a little bit, you know, 
importers or brokers mm -hmm. alike. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's essentially asking for just a lot more substantiation um, that when you sign the power of attorney, you are who you say you are. Your company is what it claims to be. It is where it claims to be. And, you know, it's a real entity that, you know, is authorized to do business in the U.S. or overseas. So, I mean, the kind of documents. Quick, quick, yeah, quick question. Yeah. So based on your experience, is there a reason why customs is going in that direction? Are there a lot of people who actually lie about this kind of stuff? And how would it work? Because if, if someone is has a fake company, then the tax ID wouldn't be correct, for example. Um, stuff like that. So in your experience, have you seen, I guess, this type of stuff being abused, that there is a need for this? Because I would assume as a, I mean, if I was going to import stuff, then I would use a real tax ID. I would be a real person for the company. Is there a reason why Customs has taken a more, I guess, interest in this verification process that they want brokers to do? Is it like a common thing for people to cheat on these kind of stuff or what? Yeah, great question. So from my limited experience, domestic companies, not really so much. The things that do happen with um, domestic companies is that, you know, and again, these are all kind of bad actors, right? It's it's not it's not for the people that are trying to do well. But, you know, I've seen it where, you know, there will be um, like a like a figurehead one company that owns like, you know, 15 different sub companies or whatever. But all the imports go through that one company and it may not even actually be that company. It might just be a um, like a DBA, like a doing business as or something like that. So when push comes to shove and they're trying to, you know, something happens, who do they hold accountable? Well, like this company kind of doesn't really exist. And if you didn't push to get, you know, things like corporate documents um, from the state that they're, they claim to be incorporated in, like, you know, if you say that, you know, I'm, I am ABC Importer Inc. registered in California, well, what we need to do is go to the California Secretary of State business search, type in ABC Importers Inc., and it better be a legitimate business. And the person that's signing the POA on that document has to be listed as a duly authorized signer. So like an officer of the company, um, because sometimes, you know, you know, people will use a DBA instead and turns out like that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not correct. Right. So you can kind of skirt and kind of get out of liability that way. Although it's a lot more, um, it's a lot harder here. The real reason, and I can't say that this is a hundred percent, the reason why this is happening but it's really for foreign importers. So I'm sure you're, you're familiar with like FIORs, foreign, foreign importers of record. You can be an importer of record as long as you have a, in a, in a foreign country, as long as you pay on time and uh, have an ultimate consignee that's here um, that will accept the goods and that has a real commercial interest in the goods. But um, what happened and, you know, I won't, I'm sure it happens in many countries, so I'm not going to talk about any countries specifically, um, but there, there are plenty of shell companies um, that would basically, because you can get a customs assigned number, as long as you can fill out, you know, form 5106, um, you can be an importer from anywhere and that importer is liable for the duties. Well, what had happened where companies would, you know, overseas would open, you know, more or less a shell company and import uh, purposely undervalued goods and do it for as long as they could until they got caught. And customs can't very well, you know, swim across the sea and knock on your door. So they would send correspondence. And by the time the correspondence would even get there, that company is closed down, doesn't exist anymore. And they go and they do the same thing, open up another. So this is, there was no accountability um, for some of those bad actor fires. And there are plenty of really good 
well-intentioned foreign importers of record. I'm not dogging on that at all. You know, a lot of them are our, our clients, but there were really bad actors that were guilty of doing that. Um, and they never got held accountable. It's really hard to have, you know, it's really hard to, to hold them accountable. So basically, um, customs is raising the bar as far as verifying identity, probably more so for foreign importers of record. Um, although it's hard because every country has different documents and different titles for officers and things like that, but at least it's a step in the, in the right direction. Um, mm -hmm. And as somebody who's in the trade, I'm glad that they're not just, you know, blanketly shutting off that option because it is really nice um, to be able to sell to your American customers DDP right up to their door. It's very attractive for, for the US consumer. So mm -hmm. that's really the, I, I assume that is the motivation behind the- But, the, as part of this uh, process, they leave it up to the brokers to kind of figure out how they're going to verify this information, right? There's no exact guideline on how to actually verify the information. So they say you have to do it, but at the end of the day, you, you as a broker, you need to figure out how can you confirm that information, whether it's accurate or not. So what if, <laughs> just curious, what if you think you've verified something, but it turns out to be wrong? Uh, is customs going to hold you as a broker liable for that information or anything that goes wrong or what? That's an awesome question. Um, I hope I never have to actually answer that in real life, but uh, <laughs> I would assume, I would assume that if you're extra, so the, yeah, like the, the printout, it does give some like helpful tips, some like helpful examples. Um, you know, like for, they even go so far as to, you know, try and, you know, see if this company has a website, but more than a landing page. So if they have like a depth of content or something like that. Like that's mm -hmm. that's nice. If you try to do that and these people are actually just bad actors and you had no idea and you really tried your best, I highly doubt. You know, I mean that that to me is, you know, I'm not a attorney or anything, but it seems like the broker is exercising reasonable care. So mm -hmm. I I th they give as many hints. So I feel like if you as a broker really try to embrace the suggestions that are in the proposed rulemaking and and but somebody still does something bad anyway you know i i, I doubt that you're going to be hung out to dry i would really hope that you wouldn't be yeah. hung out to dry yeah makes sense i mean that's the best, that's the best if you, you can reasonably show i guess that you try to verify the the information and it, you found it to be cut based on that then i mean that's the best you can do right i mean yeah at the end of the day, people who are going to act bad, they'll go to any length to make make stuff up, right? Right. <laughs> they can't really go beyond a certain point. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, for, for instance, I, I, know a, I know a really good broker tries to do things really well. And one, I think they'd been serving this client for a long time. And then one time their container got pulled off for an exam. It's routine, happens all the time. And there were guns in the container when it was supposed to be not guns. <laughs> no so way. it's, and like the, bro like, of course it's like red, you know, flashing lights, like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Like, do we ever have any sort of inkling? And then it's like, no, we, we checked all the things that we should have been doing. We had no reason to believe. And like, I think one customs officer came in and basically was like, Hey, did you know? Like, no, and they're like, okay, well, that's it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, uh, they, you know, every officer is different, of course, but I think by and large, most, most officers understand like the boundaries of what you can and can't control, thankfully. So that's been my experience at least. That's awesome. See, this is why I'm glad I have you here. Like I said, <laughs> I've never used my custom broker license. <laughs> you never work with a custom broker as well. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I'm kind of with on the consultation side of things and then the importer side of things. So I only know from my own point of view on what I have. Yeah. So it's great to have you here and kind of to understand how things are from your point of view. Yeah, well, thanks. But I mean, um, 
I'm, I'm so curious because I just can't fathom like the amount of projects that I have for compliance are like very few and far between. Um, so, I mean, like, what is a, what is a day for, or maybe not a day, but like a week or a month kind of look for you? I mean, how, how does, how does, you know, compliance for, for a company really look? I mean, are you just reading through like technical manuals on their products every day? <laughs> you know, to, it's more about understanding how you can benefit the company and working directly with the broker to make sure the goods are cleared. So, okay. um, I mean, uh, on one hand, you can fig you kind of, if you're working within a company itself as a trade compliance person, you're going to be interacting with pretty much every department, legal, okay. HR, um, purchasing, yeah, and pretty much everyone, depending on the type of stuff that you're dealing with. For example, if it's about sanction or restricted party screening, you could okay. be dealing with IT, purchasing and legal, um, yeah. and HR. If it's CTPAD, you have yeah. to make sure that the company is CTPAD certified. And yeah. in the whole CTPAD certification, you pretty much have to deal with every department as well to make sure that they are staying compliant. So when it's time to update the annual information, we can actually produce proof yeah. <laughs> that we have been doing the stuff we're saying we're doing. Yeah, uh, it's making sure everyone in the company is doing everything the way they're supposed to. Yeah, uh, whether it's about compliance, whether it's about importation, um, it could be you know trying to figure out how the company is going to resource stuff in order to qualify more goods for more trade agreements. Um, yeah, it's figuring out how you can save more. Yeah, how you can avoid penalties. And then also a bunch of compliance stuff, like I mentioned, CD pad, the city party screening, understanding sourcing, FTAs. So you deal with pretty much every single topic. Yeah. And when it comes to brokers and entries, you kind of work with the brokers themselves yeah. to understand um, and make sure the brokers are doing everything the way they're supposed to be. Yeah, right. You know, because the brokers, at the end of the day, not every broker is detailed. And not yeah. every broker is going to be spending as much time as they should be with you because they are like 10, 15, 20, or 100 other clients that they have. So <laughs> yeah. you got to figure out, do you tell them exactly what they're supposed to be doing? You provide them all the information you're supposed to provide them so they can claim free to agreements. Yeah. Um, so they, they use the proper HTS codes. Yeah. Um, you know, they have the correct values and stuff and documents yeah. for importation, stuff like that. So. So as someone who's working with, within a company, you have to deal with brokers as well as the people in your own company. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, to be honest, it's everyone, depending on the topic. Every every topic that's somehow involving customs in any way, it's going to come through you. Yeah. And just whether, whether you decide to go to your broker for something or work with your broker or align with them to make sure goods get cleared or whether if there's some crazy topic, whether you for, you go for consultation to your broker or if you hire a third party for that consultation, it's gonna depend on you and yeah. what you need. Yeah. And everything else kind of depends on how much experience you have. Yeah. Since I, for example, since I've been working on the importer side since 2018, um, I, I pretty much I've, I've pretty much dealt with every topic in customs, except I would say FTZs. FTZs, I know about them. I've yeah. dealt with, I mean, I have, I've read about them, but I, I've never actually managed an FTZ myself. Yeah. So yeah. everything I've learned, yeah, everything I've learned, everything I've dealt with, it's because from an importer's perspective, I've been, I've had to deal with those things. Yeah. So in, in, in a way, I, that's what I love about working for a company rather than working for a broker, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, working for a company who, where, where the role requires you to do just one thing. For example, I wouldn't want to work, whether we talk about brokerage, whether we talk about importer, whether we talk about exporter, I wouldn't want to, as someone who wants to be in this industry and who wants to grow, I would not want a position where I'm doing the same thing every day, like whether yeah. it's classification, whether it's FTAs or something else. You mm -hmm. know, I, I wanna see the whole thing. I wanna see the big picture. Uh, yeah. And that, that's kind of what I do 
yeah. in the roles that I take. You yeah. know, I want to be able to touch many different things and deal with many different things and at the same time learn if I have to. Yeah. And with all the changes in regulation, it's kind of like a continuous education, right? You yeah. kind of have to stay on top of everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and when there's a new topic, I do the same thing. You know, sometimes I do have to look stuff up as well. Yeah, right. Um, and yeah. I, I take the same approach. When it's a complex topic, honestly, the main thing is on my side, I, I need to understand overall what the topic is about and how, how I can condense that and summarize that and kind of apply that to whichever company I'm working for. And yeah. that's where I come in, right? Yeah. I, I figure out how I can benefit the company in terms of doing more savings, avoiding penalties, and making sure everything goes smoothly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Wow, that's super fun. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of like, uh, well, like they have a meeting or whatever, like, well, we have to like run this by Nadim first. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, and, uh, Nadine, can we do this and, or not? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you, and at the same time, you need to, you know, as a custom person, you kind of need to translate everything for everyone else yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, you need to kind of understand. Yeah. Trade compliance, mm-hmm. but then figure out how you can talk to the non-trade compliance people. Yeah, um, it's so fun. It, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's 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 fun. That's why I like doing what I do. Yeah, because I, I get to see the whole thing. Yeah, no, I don't think I can. I can do just one thing. Yeah, no, definitely. It, it gets too boring and too repetitive, you know. <laughs> yeah. And when I began my journey in trade compliance, I was just doing classification. And I did a lot of them. I, I did the toughest one, so I know how to classify yeah. because of that. But I'm so glad I moved on from that, and I yeah. can do more than that. Yeah, most definitely. And yeah, it, it, it's really huge. I mean, um, a, a really, really good guy that we have on our team, I mean, he, he worked for a, a really good brokerage for, oh my gosh, maybe like five or six years literally the same importer from the same shipper same item for six years that was his account and it's just Mm -hmm. like dude (laughs) oh my gosh you know so we try to like pepper him with like all these different you know accounts and he loves it you know he's he's like i'm sure he was was tired of it I mean, he knew every single detail about that account, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, I'm sure he was super bored with it. I can't imagine. And in a way, sometimes that's why people want to move on, you know? Yeah. This is, okay. this is kind of going into a different topic, but you no. know, I feel like if you want to retain stuff yeah. within the trade compliance or brokerage industry, you need to make sure your people are growing or at least learning new stuff, you know? Yeah. You need to tell them what's available to them. Even if they don't do something else, the fact that they are learning new stuff, I feel like that's going to help people stay where they are. You know, If you want to retain your employees, you have to help them grow in some way. Yeah. When, when the growth stops, when they keep on doing the same thing every single day, literally the same exact thing, yeah. then it gets boring and they, they, yeah. they get tired of it. Yeah. And they're humans after all, you know, <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm, I, and yeah, I mean, my, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just our sales, um, person really. I, I don't have any like management, um, responsibilities yet, but, um, yeah, one day, one day I will, I guess. But, uh, you know, what, what I love to see in our office is, you know, equip people enough to be able to go literally anywhere but hopefully they will you know love what they're doing here enough to stay and then mm-hmm. and they're well provided for as well you know that that's my ultimate goal um in in our in our company is to it's to do just that i mean this one guy he's been with us since yeah maybe like four years or so and he's just like exploded into like a full on um, food and fish and wildlife, like guru. He's just insane, you know, but like he'll come to me with, with different things and I'll come to him 
with different things. And it's really, it's fun. You know, it, mm-hmm. it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, sometimes we, he probably wants to kill me, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's great. You know, that, that that's the, the thing. Cause I know that there are a lot of, you know, and it's a completely different way to do business and, you know, it's not right or wrong. It's just whatever the business owner wants to do, but there are, you know, entry mills out there, you know, mm-hmm. where it's like $25 an entry and people are just all day, you know, cranking them out. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And we have a good volume, but, it, you know, we, we kind of want to offer people a little bit more than that. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I'm glad that you yeah. that with such a, with such a cool company too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, definitely. Yeah. I'm, um, you know, I'm happy to be where I am. Definitely appreciate it. And uh, I was just gonna make make a comment at the end. We have to remember, you know, we're we're working to live. We 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 don't live to work, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that at the end of the day, that that matters. You know, people people get bored doing the same thing. Yeah. It's important to make sure they're growing, uh, because at the end, end of the day, you know, work is great and everything, and it pays for you. But people are working so they can live a better life. Yeah. And, yeah. And I feel like that's that's what matters at the end. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think that's an occupational hazard too with, with our industry as well, is because it maybe not so much brokerage, but especially once you get into forwarding and especially when mm-hmm. you get into logistics, like domestic logistics, um it, it's really around the clock. And I've seen a lot of really, really, really talented forwarders um just completely burn themselves out you know they mm-hmm. you, you fall in love with it because it's so it's it's really fun you're like wow like i'm up like i'm moving you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of merchandise from a guy you know on the other side of the world and like i'm we're gonna get this done like that's so fun right but you know if you keep on a china schedule but then <laughs> you're doing eight hours you know in the office too i mean and you're, you're not taking care of your body and your mind like you're you're gonna collapse right and I think that's yeah. a huge, that's a huge, or like if you're a, like a dispatch or something like that, and you're taking, you know, calls at midnight, oh, like the tire's flat for this truck and like, you know, you don't get sleep. It's, it's really, really easy, you know, to get just burnt out and yeah. then or, burn and, out. Or like living to work, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. You're going to burn out that way. That's why I yeah. mean, there have been times when I have worked 60, 70 hours. Yeah. Um, just for a job, you know, every week, but uh, I don't, I mean, I don't want to do that anymore. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's Same. it's okay to do that maybe one year, maybe one half year, two years of your career because sure. you might want to go through that hoop and go somewhere, sure. but that shouldn't be your life, you know. No. Uh, now I try to work, you know, not more when it comes to a job 40, you know, 45, okay. Yeah. Um, and then I do my things on the side that's separate, but I, I keep a tab of how much I'm working because the work is always going to be there. Yeah. Right. It, it's never going to stop. Yeah. I mean, there's <laughs> yeah. a reason why the company, every company exists to make money. Things are going to keep on moving. You know, if you, yeah. if you, if you want to finish everything in a day, that's never going to happen. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I need to tell myself that more often, but yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's what I'm talking about, taking a step back yeah. and seeing the bigger picture, even about your own life, that, that matters, that's going to get you to places. No, yeah, 100%, 100%. And yeah, I think the quicker that yeah one is able to learn that lesson and really internalize it, it's one thing to tell yourself, but it's another thing to like have it be like a deeply held conviction, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And then also just taking care of yourself as well, you know, making mm-hmm. sure, you know, that, I mean, you're doing something, you know, something good for your body um, and, you know, stuff that's good for your, your mind, body, and soul too, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of nourishes you. It, I've seen people be able to, to manage, you know, a serious, serious workload without burning themselves out. But um, it's just really a matter of, of taking care of yourself and finding, yeah, you know, joy outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. You have to take care of your body and your family. Yeah, and that, that, that's what's going to be there at the end. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly right. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, James. I appreciate you being on this podcast. I really appreciate it. And honestly, we had some great conversation. And I think it's going to help out a lot of people to kind of see what goes on with the credit compliance and eh, what things you should do and what things you shouldn't do at the same time. Yeah. You know? so, so honestly, it's great to have you here. And again, thank you so much for being on this podcast. I appreciate it. Um, is there any last word of advice you want to give to the audience that's going to be watching this? Oh, man. Mm. Yeah. Just in, try as much as you can to enjoy what you're doing. I know it's so generic, but you know, if you love, if you love, um, if you're passionate about food, try to work with the food importer. If you, you know, love technology, you know, work with, uh, with a technology importer. Um, you know, the, what, what you love to do is going to last a lot longer than the money that you may make. So, you know, if you're going to pick one or the other, um, certainly pick, um, something you're passionate about um, because I've seen a lot of good people get ground out um, for picking money over that and then they end up just uh, going to what they love anyway <laughs> just, <you know? laughs> exactly you know they're like I, I have all the money I don't care about this yeah I mean, you see rich people have problems too <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly. awesome Thank you so much again. I appreciate it for the people who are watching. Thank you so much for watching, um, you know, being part of this podcast. I appreciate it. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, head over to my YouTube channel and click subscribe as well. Um, otherwise, again, thank you so much, James. Uh, thanks for being on here. I really do appreciate it. You're so welcome. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you need some goods, uh, moved or uh customs cleared you know give me a call give me a call <laughs> so yeah definitely you know reach out to me so i can connect you to james sounds good <laughs> awesome thank you james thank you so much